Our first speaker, Professor Tom Collins, is someone whom I'm certain needs no introduction to you. Tom lectured in adult and community education in Maynooth before taking up the position of director of the Dundalk Institute of Technology in February 2001. There, he oversaw a period of dynamic growth in the college, both educationally and physically, adding a new school of nursing and also a school of music. He also developed applied research in the college, the most obvious example of which, uh, for those of you who regularly drive up to Dundalk and beyond, as I do, is the functioning wind turbine, uh, which generates energy for the college and facilitates research into wind energy. It's widely accepted that Tom added significantly to the educational and cultural life of Dundalk and its environs. Tom moved back to Maynooth in 2006 to take up the position of Professor of Education and Dean of the Faculty of Social Science. He has added even more strings to his bow uh, with his foray into journalism and his column in the Irish Times is read avidly each week by all of us involved in and concerned about education. Most appropriately, Tom is now going to address us on lifelong learning in a changing Ireland. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Tom. Thank you very much, Chairman. Good morning, everybody. I just have a couple of ideas that I, I thought I'd share with you this morning. and uh, um, uh, n Nothing terribly profound, really. Uh, <clears throat> Jim's mention of Dundalk, I think, is kind of interesting, though, in the context of a changing Ireland. Uh, um, Dundalk is, for those of you who, who know it, I know we have the, the chair of Lairgus here some places who worked with me in Dundalk for five years. One of the amazing things about Dundalk is, uh, of course, that it's, it's in a zone of, a contested zone that has been contested for, I suppose, 2,000 years. And uh, if you wander up uh, about three or four miles north of Dundalk, you come across the Black Pigs dike and then you see evidence of Roach's castle built about the 12th century I think Eamon will be able to tell me when that was built. All the evidence of of um, of, a con of contestation on a border. And the Normans of course <clears throat> when they came to Ireland uh, they never really they managed to get into Dundalk alright but they never managed to get into Cross Midlen. Um, and uh, they had to go seawise through into Carrick Fergus, come out of from the north. So it's very interesting that that border zone, <coughs> and that like any border zones, it's rich in cultural activities, extraordinary rich in music, and it's rich in folklore, it's rich in, in, in archaeological legacy. One of my archaeologists, Ologist colleagues in Dundalk used to say to me that the Cooley Peninsula is probably richer archaeologically than the Boyne Valley. So you're looking at an amazing place of, of in a sense, cultural tectonic plates meeting for 2,000 years, clashing and producing richness and all of that in the middle of it. And uh, I drove to Belfast two weeks ago, and uh, I live in County Meath. I had to be in Belfast at nine o'clock, so I left my house at a quarter to seven, and I was in Queens comfortably at nine o'clock. If I had to be in UCD from where I live in County Meath for nine o'clock, I'd have left the night before. Um, and as you drive from Meath into Belfast, uh, most specifically from Dundalk to Newry, you realise that this is the changing Ireland. Uh, this is now a series of earth-moving uh, equipments and diggers and bulldozers which are laying down a new road on possibly the most contested stretch of roadway, certainly in Europe for the last 30 years and maybe in Europe for the last couple of hundred years. So. It, 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 it is impossible, I think, to talk about a changing Ireland and not see Dundalk as the very centre of the new changing Ireland. Uh, and this line between here and Belfast, in Dublin and Belfast, <coughs> now it now holds about 60% of the population of Ireland, of the, the, a 
about 6 million people who live on the island. About 60% of them are in that zone between Belfast and Dublin. We used to say in Dundalk that we were less than an hour from 4 million people. So we, we I think, and even before I went to Dundalk, I, I had this notion that Ireland ended in Fork Hill. Uh, because the border was an extraordinarily powerful one. It had, it had an overwhelming impact on our mental set. Possibly stronger than the Berlin Wall in, in terms of, of, of the image of it. And I, re, I can recall parts of Monaghan, and, and, you know, which was six miles south of the border, talking to people there in the 70s saying, ah, you wouldn't want to go up there. And that was four miles away. So this, this amazingly... Uh, impermeable barrier that has worked on this island and, and is now being, being transformed. So it seems to me when we talk about a changing Ireland, it would be remiss not to mention that the, this, the, the most dramatic change might not even be the economic one that we've all become accustomed to, but it might be the renegotiation of life on the whole island. Um, anyway, there, there's just a, a, a comment which Jim reminded me of, the, the Dundalk connection as, as a, a really rich and, 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 and happy uh, uh, memory. That's Jim, that's your paper I'm into instead of mine. Uh, there we go. Obviously, when we talk about the, the vision for lifelong learning in, our, in a changing Ireland now, there are a, a number of issues in the changing Ireland that I think are relevant. Obviously, we, 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 we have now a successful economy, and it seems to me, within that economy, one of the real problems that we have not come to terms with in this country is the realisation in public policy that we're economically strong. And, and, and I think we haven't realised that adequately over the last 10 years. Um, I'm pretty sure that there's no English word for the Irish word Ocon. Um, Joyce used to say that the only contribution of the Celts to Europe was the Quinge. And we have <laughs> a strong tradition in Ireland of, of mourning our poverty, our poverty. So finding a language of success, there's a cultural lag, I think, in our mindset, in, certainly in policy terms, between... <coughs> The, 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 the realisation that we're wealthy on the one hand and figuring out, well, what does that mean in terms of public services, especially on the other? And while, we, while our economy took this massive qualitative leap in the last 10 years, other parts of us didn't, it seems to me. I, in, in, in my years of lecturing in Maynooth, up to 1991, I used to tell our students that in 1926 we had 1.1 million people working in Ireland. And in 1991 we had pretty much the same number. For the entire period from 20, 1926 to 1993, we created no additional jobs in Ireland. We created new jobs, all right, but it just replaced ones we were getting rid of. And in the last 10 years we have doubled the number at work in Ireland. So we have made this extraordinary leap economically and somehow not made it in other ways. And I think that is a tragedy, actually, in many ways. And I think one of the key tragedies is the, 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 the sense that with our economic success is the tendency to give the money back to the people, to the individuals. And, and I really believe we need a strong debate in Ireland uh, this isn't a political statement now, but we need a strong debate on the policy of tax cuts and what that means in terms of an effective modern democracy, of a democracy that predicates itself on the position that all policies should be proofed on how they impact on the least advantaged. 